Okay, lecture 47, third law of thermodynamics. What is the third law? It states that a substance that is in a perfect, uh, in a perfect crystal, that is, there's no impurities, uh, no occlusions, no flaws. This is just, uh, just the substance alone, that one type of molecule, uh, and, the, and everything is in a nice set crystalline pattern. Then at zero Kelvin, that uh, substance is at zero uh, entropy. What that means is that when we try to find the change in entropy, and this will be the final temperature and the initial temperature, we always want the full entropy of the system, so what it had at zero Kelvin all the way up to the temperature we're at, and since these degree signs are here, that means the temperature is 298 Kelvin, then this is always going to be zero. So if you look in your tables of entropy, they'll always have we have, we'll have delta G and delta H, uh, but we'll always just have S uh, degree sign F, and this is for formation rather than final when we, uh, but, but it means the same thing. It means that we only have one value. We don't have the change um, from zero, zero Kelvin up to our temperature. It's just the entropy at that temperature because our starting entropy is always zero. So it, it simplifies things for us. Now show a graph of standard entropy versus temperature for water. Let's see if I can't, I might have to back off here a little bit. Yeah, a little bit more, there. Okay, so we have the temperature and this is zero Kelvin here. Uh, as we, so we have no, no entropy. And as we move along in temperature, it's still a solid, but it becomes more random because the molecules start to vibrate in their crystal. And then at, um, so we're at zero degrees Celsius here, so uh, 273 Kelvin. That's when we go from a solid to a liquid, and we get this sudden jump uh, in entropy, entropy of fusion, it's called. So we, as we go from molecules that are locked up in a crystal to liquid, there's going to be this huge jump. And then we're a liquid, as the temperature rises, the liquid molecules move faster and faster, so we expect the entropy to increase. And then we have this jump up as well, should be more of a straight line here. Entropy of vaporization, and this is going to be a, a larger jump up to the gas uh, phase because the molecules aren't just being, you know, from here, from solid to liquid, it's just going from locked up in a crystal to moving around kind of slowly. Here it's a, from moving around and tumbling over each other to being free to move around in the gas phase. So a huge jump in the entropy. So you should recognize this curve and be able to draw it or be able to label the parts of it. I should say this is also at 100 degrees Celsius and 373 Kelvin. And back down to Full screen. Write the three, situa uh, the three situations in which entropy generally increases and write an example of each. Now, uh, if we have a, a molecule, or a formula unit in this case, that breaks up into two, that, that is uh, the first situation, a reaction in which a molecule is broken up into two smaller molecules. So it's a formula unit breaking up into a formula unit and a gas. Uh, the second one is a reaction which there's an increase in moles of gas. So this one incorporates both. I didn't recognize what I was asking here. I just wrote down three that, that cover everything. So if you have a molecule that breaks up into more than one molecule, that's going to be an increase in entropy. The gas, a formation of a gas, if there's no gases on the other side, definitely an increase in entropy. Here's one that's more subtle, where a solid goes to, to a liquid, but going from something that's not moving, molecules that are just vibrating in a crystal, to ones that are free to tumble, tumble around, that's an increase as well. And then, uh, I'm just looking at the book, a process in which a solid changes to a liquid or a gas, or a liquid changes to a gas. Uh, so, we could go that one step further, definitely. But from here to here is certainly a... Um, a uh, change in entropy or increase in entropy as well. So I'm not really following this so much, but just trying to give you a, a lot of examples. Here's one that's very subtle. There are two gases, two gases here, but these are uh, more ordered because the hydrogens are together and the fluorines are together. By mixing them up, we get uh, two molecules, two gas molecules, but they now have two different atoms in them. That's more random. So these above here cover the, the three um, uh, 
what are the three situations where we have breaking up of molecules, gas, gases are formed, or a solid and liquid go to gas. And here's one that's more subtle. And of course, if they went in the opposite direction, for any of these, there would be a decrease in entropy. Okay, now, calculating the change in entropy for each of the following. This goes back to what we learned in chapter six with, uh, if you remember, we had delta H of uh, reaction was uh, the summation of the coefficients times the, uh, times the uh, heats of formation for the products and then uh, summing up the heats of formation times their coefficients for the reactants. That should at least look familiar. So what we do, the uh, same thing uh, happens for um, entropy. And we'll put this degree sign. Uh, if you leave it off, it just means that it could be any temperature, but if you put it in, you mean that we're at 298 which Kelvin, which is what we're normally at. So here it's going to be the summation of the coefficients of each product times the entropy of those products minus the sum of the coefficients times their uh, entropies for oops for the reactants. So what this would mean is looking at this side uh, for calcium oxide, so it would be one mole of it. It has a one out front, though we don't show it normally. And then plus one mole of the CO2 and its uh, entropy. Our standard entropy is this. Now th these are the products. And then we subtract, if we have enough room here, one mole of the calcium uh, carbonate times 92.9 joules per k mole. And we can put that in its own square brackets. So the products minus the reactants. So 38.21 times 1. So these are all 1, so that's, but if this was a 2 up here, this would be a 2. So uh, we see one of those later. So we have 38.21 times 1 plus 213.7. And this comes out to be 252 joules per K. Notice the moles have canceled. Now here's the big thing is that negative sign right there. You gotta make sure that you have that in there. Students forget it all the time on the exams. So they'll just add these up. Well you don't. Uh, you have a negative sign there so it's gonna be 252 minus 92.9 and this is gonna be 159. Now I set up the numbers but I haven't calculated this out so uh, I'm gonna move fast. So if I make a mistake just know that the setup is correct. This one's a little easier because it's just going to be one mole of the carbon disulfide liquid. That's the only product that we have minus one mole. So this is more less a reaction than a process because it's just a change of phase but still we can certainly find the entropy change or enthalpy or free energy change for these. We haven't talked about free energy yet. And this comes up to be minus 86.6. Now before I go any further, let me go back to that first one. We end up with an increase in entropy. Does that make sense? Yes, we went from a solid to a, another solid plus a gas. So it is a positive entropy value. So that makes sense. Now this one is a, a gas going to a liquid. So we should expect the change in entropy to be negative. Uh, because it should drop, it should become more ordered. And that's one another thing that students have trouble with. When it says it's a positive entropy, that means it becomes more random. When it, uh, it's a negative entropy, it means it becomes more ordered. And uh, so, got to get used to that, that, those signs and what they mean. A lot of times students get them backwards just because it's, it's new. Okay, for this one, it's going to be two moles of the water times 188.7 joules per k-mole and that's the only product put that in square brackets just I do that just to keep track of everything you don't have to but uh, to put the square brackets but it, it's nice to especially when you have three reactants and, and four products it, it'll it'll help you out quite a bit these are not as complex but still it's a good idea and just to get into the habit 
because if you don't get into the habit when it, with this more simple ones, you, you uh, when it gets to the more complicated ones, you you might make more mistakes. But that is up to you. So this is three seven seven. I'm going to keep that last digit. And then over here we have two times one thirty point six, so two sixty one point two. And I'm not going to, and then plus two o five. I'm not going to put the units yet. 261.2 uh, plus 205. So this is minus 466.2. If I'm not on the screen, I will be in a second here. Yeah. And then it's 377.4 minus 466.2. Because it's a two uh, gases, three moles of gas going to two moles of gas, I'd expect it to be negative. Again, I. I'm doing this quickly because I want to cover a lot of problems, so hopefully that is the correct number, but it's definitely the correct setup. And if, it, if it's not, let me know that I, I made a mistake. Uh, write the equation for determining the free energy, a delta uh, G, uh, describe each part. So we're not just interested in the free energy, we're interested in the change, so it'll be delta G um, standard equals delta H standard minus T delta S standard. So change in free energy is equal to the change in enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. These units are generally given in kilojoules per mole. This one is given in joules per kelvin per mole. So you're going to have to change one or the other. Usually you change to joules, or I do. Uh, just It's just easier. And then if I have to, I convert back to kilojoules. But that is entirely up to you. I rather I like adding or multiplying by a thousand to get joules than dividing by a thousand. Just for me, it, it's easier to look at. But it doesn't matter either way. Just make sure you change. Uh, make sure they all have the same units when you add them up. Okay, write the change in free energy for the following reaction using standard enthalpies and entropies of formation, and also with standard free energies of formation. Now, as we said that we did, we've done the delta H. Uh, Back in chapter 6, we just did delta S, the summation over products and reactants. And then uh, we can do it for delta G. Now, what we can do is we can find delta H and delta S and then put them into the expression delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So there's two ways of doing this. I've given you all the data for delta H, S, and delta G. So this, uh, I should go back here, so this uh, free energy, change in free energy tells us um, what we're dealing with as far as spontaneity. If delta G is less than zero, then it's spontaneous. If delta G is greater than zero, it's non-spontaneous. So we had this term before, uh, that just a, a less than zero was spontaneous. Now we've given it a a name, and we've also tabulated data for all of a, a lot of different compounds, that, and you'll find that in the back of your book. So there's two ways of finding the delta G of reaction to determine if it's spontaneous or not. One is to add do the delta H, delta S, and put them into this expression, assuming T is 298 because it says that we're at standard conditions, or we can do just sum over delta G. You might say, well, delta G, that's easier then. Why don't we just do that? The reason that we don't always we don't always have that opportunity. We're not always given delta G uh, values. So you should know how to do it both ways, and it's also a good check. So what we're going to do here, we see that we have 2. Uh, now, what's nice is when we have elements, uh, the, in, in their most stable form, we get zeros here. So this, I'm going to just uh, do this, and I'm going to leave off the units because it'll, it's just uh, a lot going on here. This is zero, so that's the products. Then we have two. And then uh, plus one times 128. I'll, I'll summarize here after I get these done. So what we did was we took the, uh, make sure everything's on, yeah. Two, there's a two here, two times its delta H. Then one times its delta H, which is zero. So this is trivial, but I put it in there just to be complete. Minus 
the reactant side. So two times a negative. Make sure you get the negatives in there. Delta H can be negative or positive. So we have everything in there. And then delta S, do the same thing. It'll be 2 times uh, 91.34. Now remember that this is a uh, different unit. This has different units. This is in terms of joules per Kelvin. This is kilojoules per mole. And then we have 1. And also notice that the entropy of this element, even though delta H and delta G are 0, it's, it still has an entropy because that has to do with the randomness. It's a gas, so it should be random. It shouldn't be 0. So that throws students off too because often they'll forget to, because they see it's an elemental form, it's nice that they notice that it should be 0 for delta H and delta G, but then they, also, they make the mistake of of assuming that uh, it should be zero for delta S as well, which it's not. So we have 98.32 times, oops, times two. Okay, and then store that, 219.4 times two. All right, plus 1.8. Okay, and this is comes up to be one, one four kilojoules, uh, just kilojoules, because we've gotten rid of the the moles. For this bottom part, when when I ninety one point three four times two plus two oh five. Okay, store and sixty six point three two times two plus two two eight point one plus recall. Comes up to be 26, yeah, 27 joules per Kelvin. All right, so if we put this in, now I'm going to change over to so delta G, delta H minus T, delta S, and this comes up to be 114,000 joules. I'm going to put in that unusual form with just the zeros. We don't normally do that, but just to show what's going on here. And then this is uh, joules, oops, 27 joules per Kelvin. And because that's such a small number, even multiplying by almost 300 is not going to have a huge effect. But it, it, is, it will be a noticeable effect, so we can't ignore it. And this comes up to be uh, 106 um, kilojoules for delta G. And it's positive. So we'd expect that this value, would, this is going to be non-spontaneous. Now let's try it from the delta G point of view to see if we come up with the same answer. Delta G should be 2 times, so now we can use these values below, minus 96.68, uh, and then 1, 0. Again, no reason to put that in there other than just to show that uh, you know, for completeness, but you don't need to put it in there. When you're doing the calculation, you can leave this completely off. And then we have 79.7. And then you get the answer completely, but just know that sometimes you don't, you don't get that data. Or that's going to be the point of the problem, is to make you work, uh, do it out. It's, it's a very common thing to do on exams, is have you work this all the way through uh, with delta G and delta S, or delta H and delta S, because then it shows everything at once, shows that you know exactly what you're, you're dealing with uh, as far as these equations. And this comes up to be 105.54, so this would round to 106 kilojoules, and it's positive. Since these, they don't have to be exactly the same due to rounding, but in this case they did round to the same exact thing, which is fantastic, uh, but it's a good check. But if this had come up to be 106 and this was... Uh, uh, or if we had gone out another place and it was 105.9 and this was 105.7, no big deal.